Richard, my one big thing this week, we didn't get a chance to talk about it since we were both in Saudi Arabia when it was announced. Um, the, mega, the mega Boeing deal between Riyadh Air and Boeing, which was really stunning and very, very good news for the US-Saudi relationship. And in a few minutes as well, we're gonna ask Jim Golson about it. Uh, he is the commercial uh, chief commercial officer in Riyadh for the United States. But just a huge deal. It's sort of starting here with outlining the scope. Saudi Arabia will purchase up to 121 Boeing 787 Dreamliners equipped with GE's most advanced Gen X engines to anchor the newly formed Riyadh Air and expand the Saudi Airlines fleet. The deals were valued at a max of $37 billion following years of discussions, although, Richard, we know that it'll be under that because they'll get some sort of deal. And then breaking it down from there, we got we sort of have been rumored about what this new airline would be called. We thought it was going to be RIA RIA Air. Uh, so we kind of got some reveals in that respect. But breaking it down, Saudia ordered 39 planes with options for 10 more, and Riyadh Air, the newly announced airline, will get 39 uh, as well of the two largest models, and then options for 33 more. Um, so that solves Richard the lingering question of whether the new airline. Uh, that was long rumored would replace Saudia, would sort of, um, you know, what, what would happen with Saudia if there was a new airline? Is there room for two? And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so Riyadh Air issued a press release. It was sort of a big deal. It was Yasser al Rumayan and Her Royal Highness Princess Rima in a signing ceremony with Boeing. And I think Tony Douglas, the new CEO of Riyadh Air, who comes over from Etihad, a Brit, um, who will be leading it up. They had this signing ceremony and it was just sort of like, the image was just, hey, you know, the U.S. and Saudi commercial relationships still going strong. This is a huge deal. Um, so the airline itself uh, hopes to serve 330 million passengers, attract um, 100 million visits by 2030 to Riyadh, and uh, service 100 different destinations, which is really cool. Um, and then you got sort of the reaction from Washington Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, praised the deals. Um, you saw Tony Blinken as well say that it was it was really good that it was happening. Of course, Princess Rima bin Thandar, Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the United States, described the deal as a demonstration of the enduring strategic partnership between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. And Richard, it's just not Saudi Arabia these days if we're not adding a separate but still significant announcement on top of this in the conversation in the same span of time, <laughs> one that would stand on its own as a big news item. But the kingdom also announced another new airline in the same time frame, Neom, <laughs> the amb ambitious development in Saudi Arabia, uh, which includes Sindala, Trojina, Oxagon, and the line, has announced that it will have its own airline as of 2024. Um, the operation will begin initially with existing aircraft, but then plans to tradition, transition, excuse me, to ultra modern aircraft beginning in 2026. And then this is a, C a quote from CEO Klaus Gorsch of the new airline. Quote, our resort will be going live in early 2024, so we need to service that demand quickly, talking about the need for existing plane technology. Uh, initially retrofitting existing aircraft with existing technology, but come 2026 and onwards, there will be new innovative aircraft, of course, uh, whether it be electric, <laughs> hydrogen powered or supersonic and next generation interiors coming online from us. So that pretty much aligns perfectly with all things we know about Neom right now, and we'll leave it at that for now. Taking stock of this deal, speaking more about the Boeing um, Riyadh Air deal, Richard. Number one, I think you can't ignore the timing of the announcement here right after the Iran-Saudi deal was brokered by China, raised some eyebrows and emphasized some frowns in Washington. I'm thinking of a frowny face and then you highlight it in iMessage and then you add the emphasis. I think that was sort of the reaction in Washington, but you know, it was also a little bit optimistic about what was going on. So you know, maybe five days, six days after that was announced, you have this massive deal, which was huge. Um, and I, again, I don't want to oversimplify it or say this is anything more than a coincidence, but imagining the one-two punch of that China brokered deal with then this announcement of a massive order to Airbus in France, the media pundits freaking out over here in the USA would, I mean, be a little overwhelming. So that's, it's really good news for Boeing and GE and the US-Saudi relationship for sure. Second, on that front, there are probably many holes in the ceilings at Boeing HQ from high-velocity corks flying into, <laughs> flying into the ceiling from champagne bottles on this one. 
Um, not just because it's a huge deal, but it's incredible validation for the Dreamliner. Um, as Wall Street Journal notes, these wide body jets are popular among world airlines because they're more fuel efficient and they have the ability to profitably carry passengers on long haul international routes. Each carries a list price of about $300 million, but there are discounts when you buy in bulk, like many things in life. And that applies to planes as well. And we don't know the level to which there are discounts on these planes, but I bet they are fairly steep given the need to get the deal done. And Richard, as you know, it's been a rocky road for Boeing since the start of the pandemic. And even a little bit before that, US regulators have forced Boeing to pause deliveries of the 787 to address quality concerns uh, from including between late January and late February of this year. Deliveries were previously on hold for more than a year, ending in August, and for a five-month stretch from late 2020 to early 2021. So, yeah, um, Boeing has had a rocky road here. So it's they're not just celebrating the size of this deal, which was large, but also validation for the Dreamliner, which is now hitting its stride. Um, third, Richard, I think as if we needed more evidence, we did not. The new airport in Riyadh, big investments, new giga projects, infrastructure projects, Saudi Arabia, and... Al Ola, as we just discussed, Saudi Arabia is definitely 100% serious and dedicated to tourism as a major driver of the economy by 2030 and beyond. And yeah, I think now that we know more about the new airline and the fate of Saudi, the plan makes more sense. You know, we were talking about this earlier on another episode, why two airlines that led to some speculation about whether one would be focused on more domestic versus international, but you already have some domestic operators in Saudi. So I think we sort of learned that it's going to be more that Riyadh Air will be more of the Riyadh hub, and then Saudi will go back to being the Jeddah hub. Um, actually, and Finance Minister Mohammed Al Jadan said Jeddah alone needs one airline to concentrate on it with the Hajj and Umrah, so you needed an airline that is focused on Riyadh. So that gives some clarity to that. But yeah, I mean, Richard, we just didn't get a chance to touch on this. I think it's one of the bigger U.S. Saudi deals in history, and really very important for the U.S. Saudi relationship going forward. That's a good one. And I, I'm glad we, I'm glad you circled back to pick it up because, yeah, a lot happened when we were both over there <clears throat> and big news. And um, and, you know, it, it, for, for, first from the U.S. perspective, it is nice to see Bo Boeing's had a great 2023. I mean, India in February, you know, ordered 220 Boeing aircraft, you know, value of 34 billion. This Saudi deal proposed deal, prospective deal is I think the fifth largest in history. Um, and it does, you're right. It does, you know, that 787 Dreamliner bet, you know, a wide body, more fuel efficient to deal with, you know, what was projected. And, you know, when they started building it, there was the Airbus question and, the, you know, the, the A380 and, the, and, the, and, the, and, you know, the Boeing Dreamliner, you know, which one and it, it and the Dreamliner is fuel efficiency you know, seems to be uh, a popular choice. Um, so on the Boeing side, that is exciting to see. The, uh, you know, on the on the Saudi side, yeah, I think it is interesting. You know, maybe they've decided that, uh, you know, Saudi will will deal with Jeddah. Curiously enough, you mentioned that NEOM announcement, Saudi just announced 25 new international routes you know, to begin in 2023. So it's not like they're, they're, uh, you know, fading away in any regard. Um, and of course, with the, the, you know, Riyadh Air, there's the question of, you know, is the, is the, is the sector already too crowded? And that's the, that's a, the big question for everybody. And um, I look at this, uh, the, the, there's an aviation, you probably saw it. We cut, we, we, we included it in, in Sustig review, the, um, and the CAPA report, CAPA is a Center for Aviation is a market intelligence group. And they were saying that the Middle East and Asia Pacific regions are expected to account for 58% of the global air passenger demand in 2040. Um, uh, and the volume of investment includes, uh, you know, basically airports in the Middle East need to invest 151 billion capacity expansion for global air passenger demand which is expected to increase twofold by 2040. Uh, it just in the Middle East alone, in Saudi Arabia, Middle East airports alone um, are expected to handle 1.1 billion passengers by 2040, which is up from 2019's 405 million. So that's you know well over double. I guess the point being, we've talked about it on the show. Saudi Arabia's make a big bet on tourism, making a big bet on aviation because they are significant parts of the global GDP. 
and because they anticipate with reports like this that there's going to be greater traffic. And because they're willing, as we've talked about again repeatedly on the show, they're willing for this to be a loss leader in order to establish Saudi Arabia in from their perspective in its proper position as the center of this this Asia African European nexus. And uh, you know these numbers are huge, and they seem they seem redundant sometimes. Uh, but you know Saudi Arabia is on a different sort of path, and it's it it sees itself. I think I think you know we all sort of suffer lack of imagination of what what Saudi Arabia's ambitions are, and uh, having two airlines, and especially this Riyadh Air, which is which really by the nature of its purchases is going to be a transit. You know these are long haul planes. People will use Saudi Arabia, will use Riyadh, uh, not only to get there, but to get to get to other places. And and so it's it's a it's a fascinating play. I'm delighted. I love, you know, these sort of large capital purchases um, like defense and other things are really important for relationships because they're long term relationships. And, I, you know, you want to see this thing, this deal closed and, and started, but, you know, they're long term commitments and long term relationships. And those are really important to the broader political relationship, if you want it. So anyway, that was a good one, Lucian. That was a good one to pull. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, the um, long you mentioned long term relationships, a great, great point. So they the deal is going to support 140,000 jobs across the U.S. So there's sort of a soft power relationship there. I mean, a lot of these jobs will be created and sustained because of this deal and other deals like it. So, and there's, you know, there's, there's just more to that. And Richard, I, I was, when I was looking up into this, just thought it was really interesting. Saudi uh, was founded in 1945. It received its first jet as a gift from Franklin Roosevelt, which is cool. Um, I didn't know that. That's a cool little, little information snack as they call it. Um, yeah, Richard, air travel is so impressive and sophisticated now. It just blows my mind every time I'm on a flight that these things are so safe and they're so generally reliable. I, I just, it's so impressive. The other thing that I thought was interesting, Richard, is Boeing last year moved its headquarters from Chicago to Arlington, Virginia, which is the birthplace of one Lucian Michael Ziegler. Um, it's really, really <laughs> cool. So the main um, motivation. Yeah, that's why they did it, obviously. Um, and Richard, you mentioned is, you know, the sector too crowded. Um, it, uh, that's a great question. I think it depends on who you ask. I mean, if you're asking Frankfurt, London, Istanbul, Doha, Dubai, the answer is yes. If we don't, right. they don't want any more players. If you're Riyadh, the answer is emphatically no. But right. I think the plan here is to sort of create a larger market or expand the market as well to accommodate some of these new players um, to sort of maybe, uh, I mean, as you know, the a new airport coming in by 2050, which should be globally um, one of the best and very impressive. So they were hoping to make the market share for the Middle East l larger. So maybe we'll be less crowded if they enter. Um, we're going to see how it all plays out. But yeah, yeah. Maybe, a, maybe a rising time to saw boats. But as you know, if you look at the projections of the Middle East and Asia Pacific, it's very positive. And, and, you know, the sort of bright spot, one of the brightest spots in terms of projected growth and Saudi Arabia is very clearly saying, OK, we want, you know, we're coming for our share of this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, and like I said, it, you know, it may bomb, it may not be economical initially, but in in in, in terms of their larger project, it makes sense. Yeah.